What's going on guys? Brandon Bird with We The Remnant. Wanted to just get on and talk to you a little bit about something that I feel like the Lord is really speaking to his church. I feel like this makes a lot of sense with what has been going on in the last few years. Um, we've been doing a study here on the book of Hosea. And there is so much crossover between Hosea's uh, journey and in the journey that the church, especially in the West, is going through right now. And and I just want to share it with you, share my heart with you a little bit, teach a little bit on what this is saying, um, because I, I think that Hosea is misunderstood in some ways. And so um, if I can just take a few minutes to just talk to you about about this, I think it might shed some light on a whole lot of, of what uh, the Lord is doing right now. And, and it all begins in verse two of chapter one of Hosea, where the Lord tells Hosea to take for himself a wife of harlotry. And the first question asked is, why would God give him permission to marry a harlot? And what we have to see is that the prophets of the old covenant, yes, they were the mouthpiece of the Lord, but they were also the ones that were to share this, the feelings of the Lord, the, the actual emotions of the Lord. And this this situation the Lord is showing through the prophet Hosea his anguish and his agony and his hurt that the people of Israel had departed from him that they had moved away from his presence their gaze was was off of him and on other things and it actually says for they had committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord so harlotry in the simple form is departure from the Lord it's distance and the spirit of harlotry, the spirit of the harlot, is simply to get you to divert your gaze away from the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. If she can distract you, then she can distance you. Seduction of the enemy in the most simple analysis is a distraction of the heart away from God's person, away from his presence, away from his voice. If we become unaware of his presence, we become naturally aware of ourselves. In chapter 2, it actually says that she, being the people of Israel, the, the bride, she went away after her lovers and forgot me. So whenever we start chasing these lef lesser lovers, thinking we're going to find satisfaction in them, what we end up doing is distancing ourselves from the one who is our satisfaction, from Jesus himself. And there is a remedy for this, but before there's a remedy for it, I want to show you the ways that the harlot tries to enter in and create the most distance with you and keep you that way. Um, because if we don't know how she operates, then we don't know how to combat it. And we don't combat it with weapons of warfare. We're actually going to see how the Lord combats it. We combat it by getting close to him. And so if our... If our weapon is nearness, then her weapon is distance. I hope this is making sense. So here are some of the things that the harlot does to keep you distant. All right. And, and I'm in uh, chapter five, but it says things like this. It says the spirit of harlotry is in their midst. Okay. And they do not know the Lord. That word know there is the word yada. It means intimacy as if to lay with total intimacy with the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also stumbles with them. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him for he has withdrawn himself from them. Okay, so that word no that we stopped at for just a second, that was the word yada. What we also see in the scripture is a word no in chapter 4. It says there's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. That word knowledge and the word no throughout Hosea are interchanged. That word is the word da'ah. And that word means an awareness of. So what the harlot does is it creates distance, both in intimacy with the Lord and awareness of his presence. This is not talking about an intellectual knowledge. Intellectual knowledge in and of itself, it's good. We need people that have a knowledge of the Lord and an understanding of the word. 
But knowledge in and of itself doesn't mean anything. Jesus in John 5 looks at the, the Pharisees and says, you think you, know, you think you know because you know the scripture and you think in the scripture you find life, but I'm standing here and you don't even recognize me. And he goes on to say, therefore the love of God isn't even in you. So knowledge in and of itself without a living practice of intimacy and awareness of the presence in your life, it, it means nothing. I use this example with our group. Because a lot of our group, um, we're, we're kind of a goofy clan and, and we like shows like The Office and, and, and stuff like that. I love movies. Dumb and Dumber is one of my favorite movies ever. Um, and I can quote a whole lot of movies, but let's just take things like, like Dumb and Dumber. Just because I can quote Dumb and Dumber does not make Jim Carrey and myself best friends. I can know his work and not know him. And this is very important. Because what the harlot tries to do is get you to be satisfied in understanding, thinking you know how to do things, and all the while being distant from him, his person, his presence, and being aware of him. This is her work. This is why a lot of people do their Bible studies in the morning. They do their, their, um, you know, their uh, discipleship booklets and stuff like that in the morning and then they go about their day and they leave him at home or they do their two two times a week church services and think that they've you know filled their cups up but we're not taking him with us we're not aware of him every second of the day that is God's desires for us to be aware of him and walking with him like Adam walked with him in the garden or like Enoch walked with him walked with him or Abraham these people under a lesser covenant that got to walk tangibly with the Lord If they got to do it under a lesser covenant, how much more can we do it now because we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit living within us? We just settle for what we think we know and we don't go after and pursue the presence the way that those guys did. And this is the harlot at work. The harlot at work is saying, you're good where you're at. You've had enough. You can do this. You can do that. And and starts creating distance. I got off on a way long tangent there. Let's get back to chapter six where it says this stuff. And what we read was she's in the midst. They have not known the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face and he withdrew himself from her. Now, here are the four things that the harlot goes after. Okay. Number one, the harlot goes after works, making us lose interest in being governed by God. Making us think that we have rights, <laughs> that we have rights to do things our way. Man, we lost the right. We lost the right to have rights the moment we made him Lord, knowing full well that he has our best interests at heart, that he has our, us in his hands. I mean, we, we have the verses that say, if he, clo- if he um, covers the lilies, how much more will he clothe you? If he knows every sparrow, how much more does he love you? Like he is perfect and he is good and he is way better than we are at doing life. And yet our works, we think that we can govern them ourselves. And this is the work of the harlot to get you to distance yourself in any area from God. So your works being being your way, not being governed by God is a, a way that she attacks you. Number two is awareness of getting us to, to lose the awareness and forsaking the importance of his presence in our midst. Um, him residing in you is different than him being upon you. Him living in here is for me. And that's great. That's my salvation is that he moved in and that I accepted him as my Lord, as my Lord. I mean, we could get into that, but we won't. But the fact that he lives in me is one thing, but he wants to move upon you and out of you and not being near to him makes that impossible for him to do. So if we become unaware of his presence, we think that it's just enough to have said yes at an altar at one point and that we accept it, accepted him as our savior. I mean, he is the savior regardless. The point that the harlot tries to get you to do is move away from the presence, living in that. So becoming unaware of him on a daily basis is a work that she does. Number three, pride. Pride fuels the harlot. Arrogance, pridefulness, this permeates a man's theology and it fuels the harlot in your life. It doesn't matter if it's hyper-religious, hyper-spiritual, hyper-whatever, whatever the hyper is, 
The pride will enable you to twist everything to fit your agenda. So if correction comes your way or or if the Lord tries to correct you, but you have this prideful nature that is being fueled and fueling the harlot, what it will do is cause you to distance yourself from the Lord and spin things to fit your agenda. And that's a dangerous thing. And the last thing that I have here for you is the, is what I'm calling wandering. It's it's man's fierce resolve of pridefulness takes root and it ultimately causes man to withdraw from dependency on the presence of Jesus in their life. Dependency, meaning I can't do anything without you, Lord. I have to have you. Man will become like resolute in their ability to twist everything and in their way to to do things the way they want to do them. Therefore, according to the scripture, according to what God says, because this is the nature of the harlot and the harlot has crept in, he must then withdraw from us. And that's, that's scary to me, man. Like the fact that God would withdraw and you say, well, he would never withdraw from you. I'm sorry. He absolutely will. He won't, uh, you accept him as your Lord and you're saying you get saved. He won't remove your salvation. It's not that, that he's so quick to let go of you. It's, it's that oftentimes him withdrawing causes this affliction and affliction has the potential to humble a man and cause man to seek God again. There is, there is no remedy for a man that refuses to come away with God. I mean, he calls us all the time and we're going to look at it in a minute that he says, I will allure her into the wilderness. I will call her away into the wilderness. The song of Solomon, we see it all the time. Come away with me, my love, stuff like that. And and that is his heart is for us to come away. But if we're so wrapped up and being distracted by the harlot and our gaze being taken off of him, he has to remove himself to an extent so that the affliction will cause us to seek him. And we absolutely will find him when we seek him. That's a promise of God. If you seek me, you will find me. But the remedy is to come away. And in order for the harlot to be destroyed, man must acknowledge their desertion from God and seek his face again. True repentance. This is true repentance. True repentance is unto a life of presence because his presence brings life to areas that have once tasted death. He is the resurrection. He is the life. So when we repent and come back to his presence, he resurrects and revives areas of your life that have been marked by death. There is not a partial offering in repentance. Repentance is unto a full offering. Partial lives laid down result in zero fire being poured out. This is scriptural. God pours his fire upon full offerings. Altars across the land are packed with partial hearts being laid down. And and I'm going to say it again. I hope this gets through. The Lord's desire is to consume all of you. A complete sacrifice of self. Partiality never unlocks reality. If you only let God have a piece of you, there will always be unfulfilled gaps that allow the harlot to have her way and to create more distance. Again, remember the harlot's prime job is to get you to depart from the Lord, is to get you to be distant. Okay, so the call of the Christian is not to add God to our moral resolve, but to dissolve, to absolutely dissolve, become one into him completely and voluntarily relinquish all lesser lovers. God is not going to make you do anything. His love is one of choice. So what I'm saying is, It's not to add him to our moral resolve. That's incorporating God into our life, but it's to dissolve into him completely. It's like if if I took an ice cube and I dropped it into warm water, that is a solid and a liquid. They are two different substances, though they're made of the same thing. 
we are humans. He is God, but we are made in his image. Through scripture, you see, especially in the new covenant, that we are to be one, but we are two. And it takes place whenever we dissolve into him. When that solid becomes the liquid and it's dissolved, you're never going to get that ice cube again. You can't reach into it once that ice cube melts into the water and get that exact same ice cube again. It's impossible. So we're dissolving in and becoming one. And by doing so, we voluntarily relinquish all lesser lovers. So how do we do that? How do we break this harlot spirit? How do we dissolve into him? In these last few minutes, let me just do this. If you're still with me, thank you so much for listening. This is important. If we can, if we can nail down what the harlot's doing, we can start seeing her in the little areas of our life and, and kill the foxes, right? This is important. So listen to this. How do we break this? Okay, um, in chapter two of Hosea, and you can read it for yourself through uh, verses 14 all the way through the end, all the way through 23, we see these things. And I'm just going to do a few of the highlighted ones, uh, but you can read it whenever you want. He says this, he says, I will break the bow and sword. I will make them lie down. I will betroth you to me forever. You will know the Lord. I will say to those, you are my people and they will say you are my God. So here is how we attack. This is how we conquer the harlot spirit. Number one, I said it just a minute ago. Also in, in chapter two, I will allure her. Okay, I will draw her into the wilderness. Okay, the first step is we have to come away with God. We have to go away with God and spend time with him away from distraction. All right. The world says that if you're dealing with this kind of stuff, that you don't need to be alone because your thoughts will dominate you and, and you'll become, you know, worse off. God does things different. And that's why the first part of Hosea to what we just read, 14 on, says, I will allure her into the wilderness. I will break the bow and the sword. I will break the bow and sword. Natural war, especially in that time, was done with swords and arrows and shields and all this stuff. And he's saying, I'm not going to do it the way that you think I'm going to do it. I just need you to come away with me. Realize, please, that Jesus has already overcome the world. We are victorious in Christ, in Christ. So we need to go away with Christ to be in Christ. And the way he does it is he calls us away into the stillness, into the silence, into the solitude where we only can hear his voice. So number one, he allures you. He calls you away. Come away with me. Come to the secret place. Number two, he breaks the bow and sword. He doesn't do things our way. Victory is already his. Number three, he makes you lie down and rest. The absolute essence of God is one of rest. When we're in him, we're in rest. When we're outside of him, we're in works. You see the harlot. When we're in him, we're resting. When we're out, we're not. Number four, I will betroth you to me. This is a bridal call. This is saying you've been distracted. You've been loving on lesser lovers. But if you come away with me, if you let me put you in me in rest, I will put a ring on your finger. I will betroth you to me again. We'll get back on track with this thing. Number four, you will know that I am the Lord. So the Lord himself wraps it up by saying, here's the way that you attack her. This is the way that you overcome the harlot spirit. You get in the secret place with me. You let me do it the way I need to do it. You lay down and rest because I don't need you to work. You fall back in love with me, first love fire. And then you know me, you yada me, you ba'ah me. You get intimate with me again. You become aware of my presence again. The very thing that she diverts you away from, your gaze being diverted away, all he's saying is bring your gaze back to me. This is a life of repentance, turning your gaze back to Jesus and pursuing him with everything that you are. In the last year or two, the church has 
had every bit of its gaze challenged. The perfect vision back on God saying there's one thing that matters. We've allowed all these lesser lovers to infiltrate what is his. And systematically, he's been calling us out. The scripture says throughout Hosea that she will chase after her lesser lovers. That it says that, for she said, let me just read it to you. Verse 5 of chapter 2. For she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, my drink. And it goes on in, ch- in verse 8 to say, For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold. We went after all this stuff over years and years, generations. We went after all this stuff. We fell in love with lesser lovers. All of a sudden, sports academics, um, scholarships, um, all this stuff. We went after it. We fell in love with those things. I mean, I remember growing up knowing that Sundays had to be done at a certain time because Dallas Cowboys played at noon. And this was a big struggle in the church for a long time with pastors of how do we tell people that football is not more important than God? It's a lesser lover. It's a distraction. It's a distancing. If you find yourself looking at your watch in the midst of being in his presence, there's a distance problem. If you find yourself being satisfied in things that aren't Jesus, there's a distance problem. And this isn't a shaming. This is saying that he's calling us back into a a higher level of living with him that brings forth more of him in your life. And, And I don't know about you, man, but like I've lived this thing out without him and it's not fun. It's fun in the moment, but... I went to bed at night very alone and very empty and I woke up the next day very upset and very mad. I did not find satisfaction until I found Jesus. And God is saying the church has created an affair. The people of God are on an affair. There are lesser lovers. The harlot is in the midst. But if you come away with me, if you recenter yourself, that I am everything you need, that Jesus is the answer, if you will fix your gaze on him. Listen, your beholding brings forth your behavior. Here's the question. Who are you looking at? Who are you looking at? Who are you distracted by? Are you looking at your pastor? He's not Jesus. He does his best to shepherd you and to move you forward. But if you're looking at your pastor to give you all the answers, your satisfaction is in a man and not in Jesus. Are you looking at your worship leader to motivate you into worship? If you are, you're not looking at Jesus. You're distracted. Satisfaction in a man. Godly men, godly women, but they're not Jesus. They're pointing you to him. Your beholding brings your behavior and you will become like the one you follow. Behold the lamb. Become like him. Walk like him. Love like him. Love on him the way he loves on you. Don't fall victim to the harlot. Seal up your hearts and fix your gaze upon the bridegroom, our lover, our our reward in this life. And we're his reward. That's what's so crazy. This is the cleansing of the bride. Don't let the harlot keep stealing your joy. Don't let the harlot keep stealing your gaze. Realize that God is pulling us away. He's pulled us into the wilderness. He's alluring us in. Press into him and let him have your life. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. And we look to you in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, check us out, we the remnant.org. Um, and let's just continue living this thing together. You can do this. Go slay the, the day today um, and love on somebody.